Our Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 15, beginning at verse 21. It's page 929, if you'd like to follow in the Bibles. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O God. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Do sit down. <coughs> I realise you're all here because you're going to rush out and watch the lionesses at 11 o'clock, but I hope I shall have your attention for the next little while. Here's a picture of our dog, Dougal. Um, our dog, Flora, I beg your pardon. Can you manage that, to put that up, Gary? He's having a bit of a fight. There she is. Isn't she cute? Isn't she wonderful? She's nine years old, but she's not our first dog, and indeed, she's not our first border terrier. Her predecessor was Dougal, and here's Dougal. Dougal was a lovely boy. Um, he was the first dog we ever had. And that meant we had to learn how to train a puppy. I have to say that is challenging. And if you've got a terrier, it's doubly challenging. Because terriers have strong wills. And apparently, Dougal, so the books told us, thought we were dogs. So what we had to convince him was that we were the top dogs and he wasn't. And the way to do that, we learned, was that you eat from his food bowl. Now you don't eat his food. What you do is put a cream cracker on top of his food, put it on the floor and then pick the cream cracker up, break it and eat it. And then he knows that you get to eat first, so you're the top dog. Then he gets his food afterwards. Now that's actually a keynote in this conversation between Jesus and the Canaanite woman, as we'll see. Because dogs show up in this. You shouldn't give the, the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It seems on first reading that Jesus is actually pretty insulting to this woman because she's desperate. She wants her daughter delivered from demonization. And there are three things to notice in this story that help us to understand what's going on. First of all, it's about grace and not race. Secondly, it's about recognizing Jesus, not rules about purity. And thirdly, it's about faith, not trying hard. Let's look at each of those in turn. It's about grace and not race. This woman is an outsider. She's a Gentile. She's unclean as far as Jews are concerned. Um, and that's why the metaphor of dogs gets used. We think of dogs as friendly domestic creatures. The only danger you're in in our house is being licked to death by flora. And she, but she will absolutely hoover up anything that falls on the floor. 
she, she's more efficient than our vacuum cleaner. But here, the term dog is being used for somebody who's an outsider. Israel, verse 24, a God's flock of sheep. But this woman is like the family sheepdog, who gets fed, but not with the family's food. And she's not just a Gentile, she's a pagan. She's a Canaanite. Canaanites in the Old Testament are people who oppose God's people. They oppose the Israelites. They bring false gods to them. They oppose God's people and God's way. And that further underlines how impure and unclean she is. And initially, Jesus seems reluctant to help her. The disciples want him to get rid of her, verse 23. Send her away. And he responds by saying something that seems strange. I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His focus is on the historic people of God, the Jewish people. This is not a story the early church would make up, is it? The early church, by Matthew's day, are predominantly Gentile. So why would a mainly Gentile church suggest Jesus limited himself to the Jews unless that was what really happened? The early Christians were really careful to preserve and pass on the stories about Jesus, even the ones that were uncomfortable for them. Jesus still resists. He, she, she comes back to him um, and persists, and Jesus goes back to her, resisting. He's got a strong sense of what's right for his ministry in verse 26. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, the word for dog isn't the word that's used for wild dogs roaming around the streets in the country, but it's a term for a household dog, perhaps a sheep dog. And his statement is not saying the dogs never get fed. He's saying there's an order of priority. The children get fed first, and then the domestic animals. And she picks up Jesus' reply really cleverly. Now, it's hard to see that in writing, but my guess is she had a twinkle in her eye as she responded to him and said, yes, you're right. Even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Um, it's not a contrast. She's just drawing his attention to the fact that the dogs do get fed. But they get fed later, after the children of the household. So she accepts the secondary position of her people as outside God's covenant with the Jews. She throws herself on Jesus' mercy and Jesus does what she asks. He heals her daughter. That's the extraordinary thing. And she experiences God's generosity to the outsider, God's grace, because it doesn't depend on race. It depends on God's incredible generosity, his grace, his giving nature. This passage is hinting at something that we'll see in full at the very end of Matthew's Gospel. When Jesus sends his disciples out to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the point where Jesus says, go out after his death and his resurrection. But this story, interestingly, is the second story of this kind we've had in Matthew. In chapter 8, we get the centurion of Capernaum, who comes to Jesus and says, will you heal my servant, who's very ill? And Jesus heals him with a word and at a distance. And he adds that from the four corners of the world, many will come and sit at God's banquet with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the great founders of the Jewish faith. Many Gentiles will be included. So Matthew is showing us that Jesus in his earthly ministry focuses on Israel, on the Jewish people, but that he does meet Gentiles and care for them when they seek him out. He doesn't go looking for them. That's going to happen after his resurrection. Matthew's showing his church 
that its roots lie in the soil of Judaism. So think about this from two angles. The Canaanite woman is the kind of person that people wrote off if you were Jewish. And there's a danger for us that we write people off. That person will never become a Christian. We can be too quick to decide who will and won't respond. Rather like the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day who wrote off Gentiles. In our church in Cambridge, there was a lady in her, her late 70s who came to faith in Jesus. And she, her, her Christian friends had known her for years, they prayed for, for years, and she read Augustine's Confessions. And that was what led to her becoming a Christian. To take a younger example, when I worked with students years ago, um, the, the university Christian Union at Durham had a special mission week with special meetings and, and so on. And I was working in one of the colleges. And I first met John when he was dancing on the tables in the dining room to ant music blasting out, which tells you how long ago it is. Um, and that was the Monday of the mission week. On Thursday, John became a Christian. Nobody, none of the Christians in his college thought that John Block would become a Christian. Nobody thought that. And yet, behind the um, outside was a hungry heart. Don't write people off. Specifically, as Christians today, as Gentile Christians, we're in danger of writing off Jewish people as, as beyond the pale, as people who reject Jesus in them, as their Messiah. Actually, there are lots of Jewish believers in Jesus around today. Um, they just get hidden because the media don't want to write or talk about them. And it's important to support those who seek to maintain a ministry among Jewish people, like the church's ministry among Jewish people. It's important to recognise we as Christians are in utter debt to the Jewish people, for it's in the soil of Judaism that the roots of our faith lie. Grace, not race. Secondly, recognising Jesus, not external purity laws. Look at what this woman calls Jesus. Three times she addresses him as Lord. Verse 22 and verse 25 and verse 27. Now it's probably a polite form of address, roughly equivalent to Sir. But there's also another side to this, because the secular use of this term was for Caesar, the emperor, a, a, a figure of significant authority. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it was used for the name of God, Yahweh. So there's more to it than that. She's hinting that she recognises there's more to Jesus than just somebody who deserves respect. And she also calls him, in verse 22, Son of David. Now this is uh, the title of somebody who's the Messiah, who's the King of David, who's the, the descendant of King David, who's going to come and rule his people. Matthew uses it far more than the other Gospel writers. He uses it ten times, Matthew 3, Luke 2, never in John. So it's a particular emphasis of Matthew. Here's how Matthew introduces Jesus in chapter 1, verse 1. This is a record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David. And here's how Jesus is greeted when he'll enter Jerusalem in a few weeks' time. Hosanna to the son of David. And according to chapter 21, verse 15, the Jewish leaders are deeply offended that he's called that. So this woman is recognising Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, the person promised by God who will come to free his people. But she's a Canaanite. She's an outsider. She's a pagan. She recognises Jesus. And that makes the link to the earlier part of the chapter. Because in verse 10, Jesus is in debate with the Pharisees and the scribes. 
And they're complaining because Jesus and his disciples aren't keeping the Jewish purity laws. They're making themselves unclean. Verse 2, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus responds by saying, you're taking the heart out of the law by hedging it round with rules and regulations. Instead, he insists, what's really important is the heart of a person. So verses 10 and 11, what goes into your mouth doesn't defile you, but what comes out of your mouth, that's what defiles you. It's what you say that counts, not what you eat. And in verses 17 to 20, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come out of the heart. And these defile you. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile you. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile you. It's what you think and what you do that counts, not what you put in your mouth. So the very people who should have recognised Jesus, should have recognised what God was doing in and through him, failed to recognise him. This outsider, this Gentile, this pagan, she's the one who truly sees what God is doing. And she also sees the direction his work is pointing, which is towards the inclusion of people who are not Jewish, the inclusion of outsiders like her. So the key is to recognise Jesus. Now we have a habit as British Christians of mistaking high moral standards for real love for Jesus. If somebody's respectable, suitably middle class, then we think they're probably on our side. But sometimes people with very high standards are very intolerant of others who struggle and fail. They can show little of the forgiving love of Jesus. The one thing that matters is recognising Jesus. We, can also, we, we also need to beware making it harder than it already is to follow Jesus when we seek to share our faith with others. We need to point people to Jesus and let him sort out the issues in their lives. People don't need to have their lives all sorted out before they come to Christ. And that's really good news for us, isn't it? What people need to do is recognise him and come to him. John, who I told you about earlier, was studying classics. So he and I used to meet up when I visited Durham and read the Bible and pray together. Um, being a classicist, he did it from his Greek New Testament, of course. Um, and we sat in John's room and on a number of occasions. The walls had lots of pictures of naked women. And I said nothing about it. Because the important thing was that I pointed him to Jesus. On the fourth or fifth occasion, I think it was, John said to me, what do you think about the pictures on my wall? And I said, well, what do you think about them? And he said, I think I should probably take them down. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. You see, I'd help, what I'd done was focus on pointing him to Jesus and let Jesus sort out that it really wasn't appropriate to have pictures of naked women on his walls. When people meet Jesus, he can change them. But it's meeting him that comes first. So it's about recognising Jesus, not keeping purity laws. And then thirdly, it's about faith, not trying hard. Jesus comments to this woman in verse 28, you have great faith. And this links back again to the story of the healing of the centurion's servant in chapter 8. Jesus there says, remember, I have not seen faith like this in the whole of Israel. Trust in Jesus, confidence in Jesus. So we're here seeing that theme developed a bit further. And there are three implications for us as, as we pray. Because faith means confidence 
that Jesus can help. She comes to Jesus, she presents her need, and she asks him to have mercy. Verse 22. Have mercy on me. She's confident he can help. The question is whether he will help. And in verse 27, she's still confident that Jesus can help. The, cr- the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. James, later in the New Testament, shows us how this relates to us as Christian believers when he says that when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Those who doubt shouldn't think they'll receive anything from the Lord. They're double-minded and unstable in all they do. It's not about screwing ourselves up to believe things that aren't true, like the White Queen in Alice in Wonderland believing six impossible things before breakfast. It's about being confident that Jesus has the ability to change things. Secondly, faith means asking humbly. She says to to Jesus, She comes to Jesus and she kneels before him in verse 25. This is a characteristic pose in Matthew for two things. It's a pose for worship. The wise men in chapter 2 verse 11 bow before Jesus the infant and worship him. And it's a characteristic pose for asking for something. As here. Kneeling shows that she's asking out of real need. She doesn't care what other people think if she's a bit odd kneeling in front of this travelling preacher. Her need is more important than what people think of her. We need to treat our standing with Jesus as more important than our standing with others and be humble and ask. And then thirdly, faith means persistence and boldness. She asks four times in our passage. In verse 22, 23, um, um, 25 and 27. And and the way the, the question is put in verse 22, she comes to him crying out. She keeps saying it. She persists. She really sticks at it and continues to ask. And she models persistence in prayer for us. Sometimes we give up too easily and God's waiting for our persistence before he'll act. He wants to work with us in that way and we need to be consistent in sticking with him and, as they say, talking things through with him. All of these dimensions are the reasons Jesus says the woman has great faith and all of them invite us and challenge us to follow in her footsteps. Jesus meets this woman's request because he looks beyond the Jewish race to the wider world under God's grace because she recognises him and sees that he can help her and because she really does trust and depend on Jesus in faith. God give us grace and strength to be like her and to be as generous as Jesus in our welcome. Let's bow our heads and pray. Merciful God, thank you that in Jesus we see your warm and welcoming heart. Thank you that you've given us the privilege of coming to live with you and to trust you. Thank you that we have the opportunity to help others come to know you too. Give us grace to be people through whom others recognise Jesus. Others come to love and trust him. And give us growing confidence in you, growing trust and faith in you, that we might walk with you in faith, in love and in hope. In Jesus' name, amen.